Welcome to another quick installation of uh, live carving on YouTube with uh, your host, myself, Alec Lacasse. Today I'm going to be trying to finish this carving. I'm going to button it up. So it should be a fairly, ideally it should be a, a brief little live stream here, just maybe a few minutes long. That's the goal, although you know, it just depends. So I'm going to try to button this guy up. And uh, this is a commission order from my website. And right off the gate, um, if you don't know what I, who I am, just a little bit about me. I'm a fo the founder of Fundamentals of Wood Carving, which is an online school for teaching folks about carving things like this, realistic faces in wood. And there's all sorts of projects there, and I'll link that in the description below if you're interested in learning about carving faces and uh, other types of things as well. There's some wildlife carving, relief carving in there, some whittling, but mostly focusing on the realistic human face. And uh, outside of that, um, I am releasing uh, some carvings on the 3rd of November, so this coming week, on Friday. Uh, actually, the end of this week. It's already this coming week. It's Monday. Wow. That was fast. So, uh, yeah, I'll be releasing a handful of carvings there. And uh, I've just started do doing that for some reason. I don't know why it took me so long to release carvings online, but here we are. And so, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to kind of button up some commission projects that I have due in the next uh, few days and also trying to make some stuff for this uh, launch. I've just got, uh, again, a very small launch coming up, maybe like four or five carvings and uh, those will go quickly. So if you're interested, check out the website. It's aleclacast.com. Anyway, this is a uh, a fun character to make. I've talked about it before, but I just think it's so fitting to the wood. It looks so, um, you know, appropriate to have this kind of nestled man with leaves, you know, just juxtaposed or really just perfectly tailored to the rough exterior of the cottonwood bark. And for those of you who don't know, cottonwood bark is a material that is really easy to work. It's soft. It's, you know, it's of course the bark of a cottonwood tree. These are plains cottonwood trees that I'm carving. And they're, they're already dead. The trees have passed away, uh, usually of natural causes. We're not chopping down trees to make these carvings. And frankly, uh, you couldn't collect the bark off of a living tree very easily anyway. So the tree has to be dying. Anyway, that being said, uh, it comes from Montana. I typically collect it myself out there each year. I go out with friends and collect the material. But in this case, I... Um, purchased some from a friend of mine who doesn't really distribute. So sadly, I don't have the best um, sources of cottonwood bark to, to, to tell you guys about. But uh, I know that if you do a quick Google search, you'll see all kinds of different sources of cottonwood bark. And I recommend the stuff that comes from out west, the United States, western United States. Um, there is cottonwood bark in the eastern parts of the United States uh, where I live. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would recommend looking at the, uh, on the on the web for that, or I guess if you have cottonwood trees, trees local to you, check that out. See if you can't find a big old dead cottonwood on a public access fishing site or something like that. You can collect some bark off of the ground. That's how I do it. Just uh, a lot of the bark comes off of the tree, already falling under the ground, some of it barely clinging on to the tree. Call that hunting for bones. Cottonwood trees have a signature kind of whiteness to them as the bark strips off and the wood shows beneath. They look like bones. All right. So I'm just getting the shapes into the leaves right now. Major shapes are uh, pretty straightforward. It's kind of a going for a layered look, starting at the mustache and going down into the beard. Of course, it's their leaves. It's not a beard, but you get the idea. It's kind of the nature of the green man. As far as the history of the green man goes, um, there are different descriptions of kind of the origin of him and different types of, uh, uh, you know, architectural designs. He was featured in a lot of, uh, of the churches of the, uh, the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, and he shows up all over the world. They call him the enigma of the green man because it's not fully understood exactly where he originates. Um, but uh, we do know that the, the Christians took the arc, you know, the, the visual and turned it into, uh, used the symbolism to uh, describe the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost through the 
leaves of nature coming out of the mouth, all that. So there's a lot of different interpretations of it. Either way, to me, it's just a really fun and interesting little um, exploration of botanical themes, anthropomorphic themes, if you want to sound fancy, human themes, like the port, like the human face. Is, is what it's all about for me. I like that a lot, at least. And so well, I like other things, too, so animals and other types of things. But that's what I'm most interested in. So anyway. Yeah, feel free to post a question below if you have one. Uh, and that's that. Just tidying up behind the leaves, getting some different uh, shapes in, trying to make them unique, have flow. You want them to be uh, not too stiff, not so flat. So I've got, you know, a turn in the leaf here, turn in the leaf here. Some of them might curve upward. In fact, we need a little bit more of that. We don't have a lot of that upward turning uh, design. So I might uh, take this one here, say, thumb below, and turn him upward. Use a gouge for that. Just come in and carve it out. There we go. Now this one is turning up. A little variation in there. It never hurts. It always makes things more interesting. Draws the viewer in. It makes the piece a lot more uh, just pleasant to look at. You know, the more you have these sort of upward curling leaves, from a design perspective, it draws the viewer back into the carving. So if you want to get kind of carried away with the leaves that curl forward, um, you can do that towards the end of the piece. And again, that'll bring the viewer's eye back up and into the piece. These are little tricks of design that uh, sculptors use all the time. Yeah, so this is uh, as much a demonstration time as it is a Q&A time. So if you guys have any questions that uh, you've been meaning to ask, this is the best place to do that. You know, folks ask me questions in the comments all the time. And frankly, between emails and comments, hundreds and hundreds of comments and emails a week. Um, and so it's hard for me to get to them all. I don't have uh, an employee that goes through my emails. I do it on, on my own. Um, eventually, we'll probably have something like that. But for now... Um, just bear with me, and if you're able to see this video now, post your questions in the comments so I can answer them in this video. If you're not here in time, uh, tune in for another live stream. I'm planning on making these a little bit more regular. Maybe doing one a week or so. That's the goal, at least. All right, so I'm pu pulling this leaf up. But to do that, I've got to take a lot away from this interior area down here. Let's see if I can zoom in a little so you can see. Yeah, for usual, the YouTuber uh, in me will always remind you to, uh, if you're not already following the channel, like, follow, and hit that bell, the little bell button when you uh, close out a full screen. You hit that little bell icon. That gives you a notification. It helps me out. And, um, it's calling me. Everyone wants to talk to me as soon as I start the live stream. <laughs> so this one's already been spoken for, this carving. But I uh, hope to have a few more carvings up uh, live on the site on November 3rd. Actually, I don't hope to. I will. I will have carvings up November 3rd. So. All right. 
See how that's kind of coming out? That's the goal. Hey, Peter. Hey, Matthew. Do you have recommendations for a workbench that you've seen is best for carving? I live in a small apartment with minimal space, so any suggestion is greatly appreciated. Oh, geez, a workbench. Great question. Um, to be honest, I'm not much of a uh, user of a workbench for the majority of the carving that I do, although, you know, um, many, many of the, some of the projects I take on, I'll use a workbench for. But I built mine from 2x4s. There are different things that you can do, you know, as far as... Um, Purchasing workbenches, you can buy them in, in, a, in a box set, you know, pre, you know, manufactured. You can get them uh, pre-made already. You can buy them from a craftsman, somebody who builds furniture, and that's a more expensive route. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's an easy enough project to take on that if you have the inkling to, uh, to try carving, then you should have the basic skills to cut some wood, measure, bolt it up, or screw it up together and make yourself a very, very straightforward, simple workbench. I mean, I can show you my workbench. Uh, it's not very complicated. And in fact, I just kind of threw it together in half a day with my friend and uh, kind of could have done better with the tolerances and making everything nice and tight, but because uh, it rocks a little more than I'd like it to, but it's a good bench. And uh, personally, that's what I would do if I were you. Especially if I was in an apartment where I had a very specific sized space I would try and tailor my workbench to that environment. And uh, yeah, so I know that's kind of general and maybe not uh, providing you with a brand per se, but uh, uh, it's, 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 the, it's, it's what I would do. It's my suggestion. So this is a field knife. I don't often use a field knife in a carving, but it was nearby, and so I'm trying it out and playing with it. It's also known as a sloyd knife. It's very long, and it's typically used, you see it being used for utensils, carving spoons, uh, forks, uh, stirring devices, spatulas, that sort of thing. And it's really nice for that purpose, but uh, it's not so much something that you see a lot of um, relief carvers. Well, this is a relief carving, meaning that it's it's to be viewed from one side. It's not meant to be viewed from, uh, you know, I'm not going to stir a pot with this and it's not a full in the round carving. So <clears throat> that's always fun to try new tools out though. I love, I love playing with, with new tools, even if they're not the right tools for the job. Uh, it, it's a lot more to do with how you handle them. You know I mean? Some of the greatest clay sculptors in the world, they use, uh, everyday household kitchen utensils to make their sculptures. So Matthew says, no worries, I'll have to get creative. Thank you. Have you done characters from movies or video games? It'd be awesome if you carved Kratos from the God of War franchise. Oh yeah, Matthew. No, I haven't done a lot of uh, video game uh, carving because I'm, I'm just not very aware of the types of characters in those games because I'm not really playing those games a lot or uh, really at all. Uh, I've got a lot, I've got a lot of entertainment here in the shop. And so that's, that's not my outlet, but, uh, yeah, I'll have to look at that character. I'm not, I'm not familiar with Kratos or I don't know how to say it, Kratos or whatever. But yeah, I bet there's all kinds of awesome artwork and video games that would inspire cool carvings too. And a whole fan base that follows. So yeah, cool suggestion, Matthew. Thank you. Good idea. Green men are actually fairly time-consuming projects because there's so many little undercuts and details that happen in the leaf area that make it, uh, you know, less than just easy to knock out. So that's a good thing. And, and also, you know, slows you down, forces you to slow down and really enjoy the process. The sounds of carving, the beautiful grain, the colors, you know, forces you to really appreciate everything that you've, everything that you're doing in the project. Just 
using a V tool. That's a V tool to get in and underneath the leaves. Make them appear as though they're kind of coming away from the background. Now, I don't want to bore you guys. I'm not going to keep this live stream going for the whole duration of the carving. But I just uh, thought I'd pop in again today, say hello, since I'm already working in here. Headed off to the uh, to the big shop, my parents' shop, for the big old deer project. Working on that commission today. Hopefully, really start refining the forms. Maybe I'll pop on and show you that as well here, on maybe on Instagram or community posts and uh, eventually there'll be a video about that but yeah look at that see how this just flaked off you can't let that stress you out because you know found wood like this meaning wood that's not uh, been properly dried and killed you know in a kiln or um, maintained in a way to prevent this is going to do this sort of thing so you've got to be uh, ready willing to uh, address problems like this it's, it's inevitable they're inevitable you've got to expect them so I tend to keep a little bit of glue around. And uh, Pepper Guy says, uh, love, really love this channel. I started years ago after some surgeries, but then I stopped. Really enjoy carving and just found my tools yesterday. I may stay back up now. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely. Let's get after it. Very good. Yeah, glad that you're finding your passion for carving again. It's, uh, it's definitely... Yeah, it's a slow, it's a slow moving thing, really. And that's what's great about it, carving. It's kind of, it opposes almost everything else in life. So I've got the glue on there, the accelerator. And you don't want to bite your nails after you're doing that, but. All right. So this is based on a carving that I've already done in the past. It's, uh, I don't usually like doing that. You know, I don't, I don't love creating things to kind of mimic old things I've done, uh, if I'm being totally honest. And so that's why I'm putting a different spin on this one. It's a little bit, uh, different. So, you know, anytime you commission me to do something that I've done before, you can't expect it to be exactly the same. It's going to be a little bit different and, and that, that keeps me engaged in the project and having fun and, because otherwise, I'm just kind of reproducing the same stuff, and you know, there might be there's going to be similarities to the process and to the characters, and my style is going to come through. But um, yeah, I really, really enjoy changing things up. So yeah, you see the how the the leaf shape is coming in. I'm getting the kind of almost heart shaped leaves, and it's almost like an ivy. And I use the shape of the tool to. Uh, the gouge to kind of to cut those shapes in using the number four this is a slightly curved gouge i'm trying to vary the size of the leaves a little just like so okay Do you ever go through a phase where you find it difficult to get yourself in the mindset to carve? How do you overcome that? Oh, Jacob, this is a great, great question. I love that question because, uh, yeah, I have that all the time. All the time. I feel uh, just a very subtle resistance to carving, you know? Like, um, it's like, well, where do, I, where do I start? Is this feeling, for me, you know, I've got a lot of commission orders. I've got people... Uh, who, you know, have, we have deadlines and all this. And, and so I think a lot about, you know, how to prioritize the carvings, the ones that are most time sensitive, you know, people who are most time, you know, who have a, a deadline for me, you know, they need it for something in particular. Um, those, those projects weigh heavy on me. And so, uh, but then you have to prioritize the ones who came before them, right? And so there's all this to consider. And, uh, Anyway, that being said, uh, it's a uh, delicate balance and you also have to, to keep up with the small projects while you're doing the big ones so that you have a steady flow of uh, income coming in. And there's all these sort of business elements to it. And so that stuff gets in the way of me carving, right? Because I'm thinking about all that stuff. I'm pacing back and forth 
in my shop or I'm thinking about it, you know, I'm poking around on the internet to distract myself or to try and go on, uh, you know, on, on the payments, you know, banking website or the, you know, the website, social media, all of it, right? There's just so much to be distracted with. That's my biggest hindrance. It's, I, I'm, I'm excited to carve and uh, most of the time, but, you know, but, but many times I feel this sort of pressure coming in from the outside from all these other responsibilities and that subtracts from carving. So, you know, it's so silly, it's almost silly to say, but just the act of picking up the tools and pu- forcing myself to carve is the easiest way to get past the resistance. As Stephen Pressfield calls it, the internal resistance that prevents me from getting things done. It's, it's, uh, it's a challenge, you know, and, and having, having a, 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 a schedule is helpful too for me. Um, again, though, you're, you're talking to somebody who I, I don't carve just because of inspiration. I, I, I feel inspiration when I'm carving and I don't, I, the inspiration doesn't motivate me to carve. It's the schedule and the fact that that's what I do as a career that, that, um, pushes me to carve. And when I do, I'm reminded of the fact that it's an inspiring process. It's a creative process, an artistic process, and it's a beautiful one. And I, I appreciate it. So, uh, but it's at the same time, it's really not a job. I mean, it's like a, it's a passion as much as a job, but yeah, at times you sort of treat it like a job. Um, and it will always yield, the, you know, the, the result, the, the joy uh, that comes from a hobby, even even though it's it's a job. I, I don't subscribe to this thing of don't turn your hobbies into a job because uh, I, I just uh, I get the joy that I used to have as a kid from carving now, you know, the, it, and it, it doesn't it doesn't have to go away. It, it comes from challenging yourself to do new things and uh, and to organize yourself in, in a way that makes it feasible to continue the work you're doing. And so, yeah. I try not to rely, I guess just to summarize it all, I try not to rely too much on my inspiration to do stuff because I might not even start something if I don't, if I, you know, if I don't feel inspired to do it. And, uh, but you know, I don't want to leave the shop feeling totally worn out. I want to leave the shop wanting more, right? And so I, I tend to, I tend not to t- totally fry myself or burn myself out on projects. You know, I, I like, I, I want to feel the, uh, the general overall excitement for what I do. And so, you know, I try not to kill myself, if, I, if you will, figuratively. I never make duplicate carvings. When you do that, you move from, a be- from being a carver creating to a manufacturer of products. Yeah, that's Robert. That's a great point. Peter says, and you're writing a book. All needs significant self-motivation. Great example and life lesson. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, so the book is also coming out uh, in this in the spring, and so that's being edited right now, and there'll be re-edits. I'm sure there'll be rewriting sections and all that. It's pretty pretty soon here. So thanks, Peter. I appreciate the the, the kind words there. Yep. So you know, as with anything, there's just a little bit of dedication um, or commitment to your craft and sometimes a lot of commitment there, there, there has to be actually a pretty great degree of commitment to your craft to be able to do things um, do things well and so you don't always kind of show up when you feel like it you show up and uh, you choose to feel like it that's really what it is I know that sounds contrived and fake but uh, yeah I think it was uh, Seth Godin who said something to the effect of, um, you know, if you can't, uh, you know, instead of doing stuff that makes you happy, feel happy with what you're doing, right? It's like so much, it's such a great uh, practice because we, we can't always change our environments in the immediate future. Um, we typically can control those things. Uh, in the long term, but you know, our immediate future for me, I know I have to get this carving done today. 
And so instead of thinking about all the things I have to do and how sad I am that I'm doing this, instead of the other things, I can think about how much fun I'm having with this and how, you know, 15 years ago as a kid, I would have killed to have done this for a living. There's definitely a thought game. And you know, one thing I've found is really helpful. And uh, I, I hate that it's been so stigmatized and stereotyped as a sort of self-help concept uh, in everything that the tackiness that uh, is associated with that self-help genre of thinking. But when you have positive internal dialogue about yourself and your work, it just makes what you do so much more fun, right? The critical voice within you um, is very, very important to hear. It's important to, to hear that voice that says, that leaf is way too big. That needs to shrink. You need to shrink that leaf. Or the internal voice that says, uh, this eye is crooked. It's not straight with the other. And it makes the whole thing look lopsided. That's an important voice to hear, but there also has to be this counterpoint that says, oh man, this looks awesome. You know, I love the way this looks. You know, the, the, this sort of internal excitement and sometimes you have to teach yourself to feel that way. If you're anything like me, you're, you're, you're somebody who um, values achievement and wants to achieve something with each piece that you make. You sometimes get caught up in a, in a sort of what, what cycle, a feedback loop of dissatisfaction. And so just saying to yourself, you know, I, li I like the way this is turning out. This is working out. <laughs> as tacky as that sounds. Um, can make a huge difference. You know, the way that you talk to yourself, like you're killing this, you're going to do great at this. You know what I mean? That, that sort of thing. Just allowing yourself, give, you, give yourself the space occasionally during a project to say what you're doing is cool. <laughs> That's such a, I mean, we don't allow ourselves the, the, you know, some of us are better than that uh, than others, but many times we don't allow ourselves to think those positive thoughts because we think that'll make us worse at our carving or worse at our art form. But the reality is if we're discouraged, we're a lot less likely to show up to this workbench. You know, you're not gonna show up to the workbench if you're not having any fun. So your shot, your internal monologue or dialogue, whatever you wanna call it, that is important. And I've neglected that for, for years. You know, it's, uh, it's not always easy to have that, but uh, I have so much more fun carving when I remind myself that uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. This is good. This is working out well. I, I enjoy this. This looks cool. That sort of internal dialogue is great. Of course, back and forth. That critical brain is important too, you know? That, that perfectionism, that desire to get things right. That's super important as well, so. Okay, I never make do... Yep, okay, I already read that. Okay, guys, I'm gonna uh, just button up this carving. Uh, add a few more details to the leaves. I'm actually pretty close to being done. Um, check out the drop, the carving drop online on the school page. Uh, that's aleclacasse.com. You'll see my name in the, uh, you know, the title of this channel is my name. So <laughs> you got the spelling right there. It's just my name.com, aleclacasse.com. And the online school is there as well. If this is the sort of thing that appeals to you, you want more, uh, instruction and thought process into the how of making these sort of carvings you're into that if you're like me and you just absolutely fell in love with the sound the color you know the feeling of making these pieces of artwork uh, then check out the online school or check out some of my other videos on youtube and uh yeah i appreciate the support you guys it's been huge to see everyone um coming to the channel and uh the subscribership in the last couple of months and uh very excited. I, I, uh, I commit to you guys here uh, that, that the YouTube channel is going to continue to improve in terms of the, the instructional content, the quality of content as I invest more time into that. Um, I look forward to continuing to make awesome stuff for you guys. So thanks for that. Thanks for the support. Um, my, my video guy, Sam, will be, uh, you'll be seeing him more in the videos and that's why I'm confident to say the videos will be awesome because Sam is an awesome video guy and uh he's gonna start to help me out with the youtube channel 
as he does with the, uh, the uh, online school. All right, I'm going to keep talking if I don't end this. So. Any other questions before I leave? Cool. Thanks, guys. Be well. Be blessed.